Uh, take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 first, and then I'll instruct you on where to go there. Appreciate uh, everybody being here this morning. Uh, Michael, are we doing okay so far on the online deal? Good deal. Appreciate that. Appreciate the prayers. Uh, pray for me this morning. My head's just rattled, and uh, I don't like days like this, uh, but they come sometimes, and um, so just pray that out of, out of my weakness, God will be strong this morning. I've entitled the, the, the messages, This Is Your Life. It occurred to me years ago that walking out of Egypt, as far as me was concerned, and walking into Canaan land was not going to be such an easy task. Many things have jumped in the way. Many things have come into my life to try to stop me from walking into heaven's gates. I know that for a fact. I know that many things the devil has tried to stop us as far as all of our ministries go, including our radio ministries. That was made very, very clear this year. And uh, we are very, very close to being back online on both stations now. And uh, I praise the Lord for that. God, they're, they're, God's, they're, they're God's ministries. They're not mine. They don't belong to me. Um, God can shut them down when He wants to. God can use them when He wants to. It is completely up to Him. Had I known when I was nine years old, when I bowed at an altar and asked Jesus into my heart, had I known then how difficult it might have been throughout my life, I, I, might, I might not have done it. I might not have... I might not have gone down. God doesn't tell us everything in advance. He doesn't tell us or show us from day to day what is going to happen. But He does prepare us for what it... When it does come, He does prepare us. He does help us. And He's always there for us. And I want you to consider this this morning. This is your life. God, if God has brought you out of Egypt... And you believe that you're on the road to the land flowing with milk and honey, to the promised land, eternal life in heaven with Jesus Christ, the escape from the prison of the lake of fire. If that's you this morning, I want you to pay attention now to these messages so you can understand that there are going to be times in your life when, it, when the devil will try to stop you from going. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1, I'd like for you to open your Bibles up to that since you, it's, I made it so small you can't possibly read it up on the screen. That's done on purpose. It's like... The contract you get with that little bitty writing on there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. I do not want anybody not knowing this. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. That, what that means is, as they ate manna from heaven, we eat, our soul consumes the Word of God. And it says that they did all drink the same spiritual drink. And what that means is, as their bodies consume the water that came down from that rock, we're gonna, I'm gonna preach on that this morning, that same they did all drink that same spiritual drink. Our soul drinks in the water of life given to us freely by God Himself through Jesus Christ. And I want you to focus on this now. 
What, what, ha- what, it, what has serving God cost you? Nothing. Nothing. And I can tell you this, after living for God for most of my life, that if I ever thought that serving God may, may have cost me something in life, I can guarantee you, whatever I think I've lost, God has repaid back double, triple, seven times, ten times, a hundredfold. I can tell you that without any doubt whatsoever, God always gives more than anything that I might say I've ever lost in my life. They all drink of that same spirit, of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. I want you to remember that I said that, that the Bible said that. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness, which means that they did not make it. They did not make it. I grew up in this church. I grew up with a, a group of young people. That for the most part, to my knowledge, are not living for God right now. That's not a boast on my part. I can only tell you that it's been by the grace of God and His mercy. With many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now all these things were our our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. If I were you, I wouldn't be here on that sermon day. That's just a joke. Because it will be uncomfortable. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things, he says, all these things that happen. Unto them for in samples... And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now, Lisa and I just came back from the Grand Canyon. And one thing I've noticed that they've done over the years, maybe I just don't remember it back going all the way back to 1985 when I last visited the Grand Canyon. But they've got, they've got iron bars and a pathway for you to walk. And the iron bars are for what reason? To keep you from falling over the Grand Canyon, which is a long way down and a lot of bumps on the way down. And you're going to hit every rock between there and the Colorado River, you're going to hit every one of them. It'll look like a Wiley e. Coyote Roadrunner show. There's one area that we saw a bunch of young people down there. And of course, Caleb just had to run down there. No iron fence, nothing. Lisa said, don't you go down there. I said, you don't have to tell me that. Ain't no way in the world I'm going down there. I know, Listen, I am 55 years old. I know how clumsy I am. I am Mr. Clumsy. It, you could see me just falling over the edge of the Grand Canyon. You, you could see me doing it. But they got warning signs everywhere. Don't do this. Don't step over this. Don't do this. Why? Other people have done it and have fallen to their death and have died. And when they tell you don't do this, they're telling you that for a reason. Don't do it. Now all of these things that are written in your Bible, they're warning you, they're telling you, don't do what Israel did here. See what Israel did here? 
Don't do what they did here. They made a mistake. They died for it. They suffered the consequences for it. If you look at this Bible and you believe it, you're going to get anything out of it. You read it and you heed the warnings of God. Don't live the way they live. Somebody say amen. Now, again, out of approximately 2 million people that left Egypt, out of those 2 million people, the two that made it into Canaan were Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them, over 2 million people, perished and their funerals were held in the wilderness and they never saw the promised land, including Moses and Aaron both. Neither one of them made it into the promised land. That's an example to us. Now, turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 17. There's a story, story I learned in Sunday school. I heard it multiple times in Sunday school. I heard it preached multiple times from this pulpit and other pulpits. This is the story of the rock that Moses struck. And why did Moses strike this rock? What, what was the story? What was the reason behind it? This is one of those issues I mentioned to you earlier this morning. I wanted you to, wanted you to pray about it. I wanted you to think about it. Is that in life, understand something. If God leads you someplace, He does in fact know what He's doing. Now that's, you can, you can say amen to that until it happens. Just like John did. You can say amen to that until it happens. And then when it happens, usually the first thing in our heart and our mind is, what, God, are you crazy? Are you nuts? What did you bring me, what did you bring me out here for? Why did you bring me out here for this? What was, what is this all about? Did, are you not, do you not care about me at all? I've been through that. I've been through that. We're looking at times coming ahead of us because, because of social media, because of the internet, because of everything that's out there, all this information floating around out there, we, it ends up in our feed and we read it and it just blows our mind and we're going, oh no, oh this is getting bad, oh this is getting terrible, oh my goodness, oh the, the, oh, the evil people, are they're getting in control of everything, they got their hand in everything, oh we need to rise up and do something about this, oh my goodness, oh what are we going to do? Do you not understand? That everything that happens fulfills the plan and the ultimate will of God. And God has a reason for it happening or it wouldn't have happened. Understand that. Get that in your mind. That'll drive out 90% of the fear that enters into your heart when you start reading all this stuff on Facebook and on YouTube and about how, oh, how bad it is out here and oh it's getting bad over here and oh they're going to start making us do this and oh that's the mark of the beast and here it comes we're going to be end up taking the mark of the beast and oh my goodness I'm going to wake up one morning I'm going to have the mark of the beast on me I just know it I just know it's going to happen that way let's read Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. Now that, that word sin is Sinai. They're in the wilderness of Sinai. They're in the area of Mount Sinai. This is Exodus 17. By the time we get to Exodus 19, they're going to be at Mount Sinai. 
Now, I do think it's interesting that they journeyed from the wilderness of sin. To me, that's interesting. After their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and looky here now, look in your Bible, and lo and behold, there was no water for the people to drink. Now, who led them there? God did. God put them there. Ask the question, do you think God has a plan for giving over two million people enough water to drink? He fed over two million people every single day and he did what he promised on Friday. He always gave a double portion. And if you went out and gathered a double portion, you had enough on the Sabbath day so that you didn't have to go out and gather just exactly the way God said. And it happened that way every week for 40 years. Never, God never failed, ever, one time. There was never a day when it didn't rain manna from heaven and except on the Sabbath day, and there was never a Friday when they didn't get a double portion. It never happened. And God leads us into situations and we wonder, God, God, why did you put me here? Why did you bring me out here to die? Why did you lead me all the way out here just to kill me, just to expose me, just to, just to, uh, to, to, um, well, I can't even think of what I'm trying to say. Look, look at verse 2. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Now, what sin is that? It is the sin of thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That is a big thing with God. That is exactly what Jesus said to Satan when he was being tempted in the wilderness. He told him, go ahead and jump off of this cliff. He was at, must have been at the Grand Canyon. Go ahead and jump off because God said he would, he would give his angels charge over thee and he would not allow them to let you dash thy foot against the stone. So if you jump, God has to send angels. Jesus knew what that was. It was tempting God. Now, Jesus was on perfectly solid, stable ground that he was standing on. There was no need for him to jump. But Satan was trying to get him to do that. Now, let me give you what I think is our equivalent to this in this day. It is the idea that you can sin your sin and make God forgive you because God said, I'll forgive you if you come to me. Go ahead and sin it and God will forgive you. You are tempting God, when you do that, somebody say amen. So they murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is it that thou brought this verse three? And the people thirsted there for water. The people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us up out of the Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? And they be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee the elders. Now, I want you to, here's what I want you to do. I want you to compare Israel with their great, 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 great grandfather Abraham. Who upon when God said, Abraham, take thy, Abraham, Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son. Take him to the place of which I will show thee and offer him up there for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And Abraham immediately grabbed Isaac and made a two day journey to Mount Moriah. And his son is saying, daddy, 
we have the wood, we have the fire, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham, that famous saying that's in our King James Bible, Abraham saying, don't worry son, God will provide himself a lamb. Abraham was even thinking, if I have to kill him, God's going to bring him back to life. Why? Because God made me a promise. God made me a promise that through Isaac was my seed going to be carried on. And I know God doesn't lie. So I know that if I have to kill my son, God's going to raise him back from the dead. That's what I know. Now compare Abraham with his great, great, great grandchildren out here in the wilderness saying, God, you said we were going to the promised land. Now we're out here in the middle of the desert. There's no water. Would you just bring us out here to die? Faith kind of dwindles after a few generations, doesn't it? I mean, stop and think about it. The faith that you have, for some reason it just seems to have a hard time setting in on your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. That's tough to take. That is tough to take. So, verse 4, Moses cried unto the Lord and saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee before... Uh, behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock. There shall come water out of it and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Let's pray. Father, I ask your blessings on this message. Lord, help me to preach it. Help me to preach it right in Jesus' name. Lord, help my weakness today in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I want you to understand the symbolism of this. What is the stone? What is Moses? What is the rod? I want you to take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter uh, 53. Isaiah chapter 53, there's a, there's a powerful, powerful typology here. There's a powerful picture here that I want you to understand. On the worst day of my life, On the worst day of my life, I got on my face before God and I said, God, why? Why did you let this happen? God, why did you let me go so far away from you? God, why did you do this? Isaiah 53, and I want you to understand this is a prophecy of what's going to happen on the cross. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root of a dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And when we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, what? Stricken and what? Smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Somebody say amen. Now let me explain to you what all this means. Who's the rock? The rock is Jesus Christ. What does the rod represent? It represents the chastisement of the law. What does Moses represent in this case? Moses represents the lawgiver, the law itself, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not... Uh, kill, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, all of those thou shalt nots that we did. 
That rod that God said, Moses, Moses, let's go with the elder. Moses, don't forget your rod now. Moses, don't forget that rod. Take that rod with you. You're going to need that. Moses, I want you to come over here and I want you to take that rod and I want you to smite that stone. What that represents is God taking the chastisement that belonged to us. The rod belonged to my back. The rod belonged to me because of my transgressions. Because of my sins. Not for Christ. He hadn't done anything wrong. God took His only begotten Son. And because of the law, had Jesus chastised, did they put stripes on Jesus? They certainly did. They nailed Him to a cross. They put the crown of thorns on Him, a representation of our sin. And He hung there and He bled and He died for you and for me so that you and I would have eternal life in heaven with God forever. Somebody say Amen. Amen. Here's Moses smiting the stone. And when he did, water began to flow out of the stone. A river of water began to pour out of that stone. God did not have to do this. But he wanted to show Israel, I have always prepared a way for you to go. And when it looks like that there is no hope, I will be your hope. And when it looks like that it's failed, I will be your victory. And when it looks like there's no water and you're going to die, I will be your water. I will give you what you need. I will sustain you. If you trust in me, I will give you what you need. Somebody say amen. You are going to, listen to me, you are going to run into situations in life where God will literally strip everything away from you. He'll take it away and say, now what are you going to do? What are you going to do now? What are you going to turn to now? How many shovels do we got? Can we dig wells? We, we can't do anything. How are you going to make it? How are you going to live? I can tell you the testimony of a woman in Turkana, Kenya, who said that she hadn't eaten in four days and she finally prayed, God, I don't want to die of starvation. God, would you feed me? A motorcycle pulled up to her little hut, dropped off a bag of food. And she danced before the Lord and she said, thank you, God. And thank you, Mzungu. And thank you, Bethel. If God cares about those people, he surely cares about you. Somebody say amen. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And I want to say this to my children, and I want to say this to my grandchildren, and I want to say this to the young couples in this church, the young parents in this church, and I want to say this to the grandmas and the grandpas. Maybe you haven't run into this yet. Maybe you have not hit this place in life yet. But I promise you, there will come a time in your life when you will be, you will be asking, is God among us or not? Is God with us or not? Is there a God or not? I sat in the car one day. My wife knows this story. I picked up. A, I was so distraught. I was so distressed. I was so just out of my mind. I picked up a Bible and I held it up like this. And I said, God, you need to tell me whether this Bible's true or not. 
God, you need to show me whether this word is true or not. God, I, I'm having a problem. God, I need, I need your witness. I need your testimony. God, you need to tell me whether or not this book is true or not. And my wife, through the Holy Ghost, God spoke through her and said, Mike, you know that book is right. And I wept. And I'm telling you, I, I, I can't tell you the situation, but I'm telling you, God gave me what I asked for that day. And I still have what he gave me that day. I still have it. I've been in those situations where I've ran up into that place where there was no water and asking God, God, are you with me or not? God, are you on my side? God, are you going to help me? God, are you going to get me out of this? God, did you just bring me this far to expose me? God, did you just bring me this far to, uh, to kill me? Did you just bring me this far to get rid of me, to make me a gazing stock, to make me a laughing stock? Is that what you did, God? Because God, if that's what you did, you, sh you should have just killed me a long time ago. That would have been a lot easier and a lot better for me. But I was so wrong. God didn't just bring me to string me along. God brought me to a place where there was no water so that I would cry unto him and God would give me water of himself. And that water I'm still living on today. Isaiah 41, 17, When the poor and the needy seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst, I the Lord will hear them. I the God of Israel will not forsake them, the Bible says. Jeremiah 17, 13, O Lord, the hope of all Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Hey! You remember that day when them fellas brought that woman that was caught in adultery, apparently adultery by herself? I didn't know you could commit adultery by yourself. But apparently they caught her in adultery. And they come dragging her out before Jesus. And they said, look at her. We caught her in adultery in the very act. According to the law, she should be stoned. What say ye? And what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He started writing in the dirt. Now, do we know what he wrote from that passage? No, but I think he wrote their names in the earth on that day. Yep. John, Jim, Sterling, Mike, Dave. Bill, he's writing us all down, isn't he? And what did he say? Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. God said, they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Hey, everybody look up here for a second. Nineteen ninety seven, God called me to study Bible prophecy. I did not know then why. But then a few years later it became clear that I was gonna be a King James man, and everywhere I preach, I'm gonna tell everybody. King James Bible. Even to the extent I got invited to a conference in Dallas, Texas, a Bible prophecy conference, I got invited. And then I got called before I went down there, Jody, by one of the guys that invited me. And they said, uh, are you going to bring up that King James Bible issue? And I said, Everywhere I go, I bring it up. If it's a problem, send me a check for my plane ticket. I'll stay home. I won't cause trouble. 
I'm going to bring it up. So what have I been trying to tell you, the people of this church and you people online, for years now? Read your Bible. You got out to a place in life and you said, there's no water. Look what God did. He brought us all the way out here to kill us. There's no water around. And God said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's this? This is the rock. And this is where the water flows out of it. And I'll tell you, every time I've needed a drink, I've gone to it. It's just been full of hot springs, Arkansas, mineral, ice cold water. If you've ever been to hot springs, Arkansas, drink that cold water that comes up out of the ground. You'll never drink anything else like it in your life. When you drink this book, I promise you, you'll never take a drink from another Bible as long as you live. Amen. Psalm, turn to Psalm 78. Apparently it's an important chapter. That's why I make it small. Psalm 78, verse 5. You listen to this now. Everybody listen to this. Psalm 78, verse 5, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known, that they should make them known to their what? Children. That's why I'm pre... My kids? Kids? This is why I'm preaching this message. God has laid my family on my heart. My family. This is why I'm preaching this message. If you think that I'm going to nail you to the ground and let my kids get by with anything they want to, you're hearing different this week and last week. If I save the world and lose my children, what have I gained? What have I gained? I want my children to know what their daddy and their mama has found out through life. That when we get to the place where we think that there's no water, God, through Jesus Christ, provides water. And he had to smite Christ in order for it to happen. He had to sacrifice his own son in order for us to receive that water. But he's going to give us that water. They, that the, watch this, that they should make it known to their children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born. The children that haven't been born yet, Courtney. That boy that's in you. I want him to know that his Savior loves him and died for him. The children that have, that have been born yet should that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in His law and forgot His works and His wonders that He had showed them. Marvelous things did He in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. And He made the waters to stand as an heap. And in the daytime also, He led them with a the cloud and all the night with the light of fire. He claimed the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of a great day. Depths. And he brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the most high in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spoke against God and they said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Can God 
Is there not a God that can satisfy your soul? Somebody say amen. I know my children. They have the same lust in them that their mom and daddy does. And that their mom and daddy has the same lust, same desires, same wicked, weak flesh as their, as their mother and father's had. And my grandpa, my grandma had. My grandma loved the Lord, loved her Bible. I ended up with her Bible a couple weeks ago. I just cried and bawled like a little baby. As I read and looked at things that my Mima underlined in her Bible that was important to her. She was a woman that had been through horrible things in life and yet loved the Lord her God and was not going to forsake him, nor was she going to forsake the word of God. And by the way, it was the King James Bible. And I just want to say to you this morning, don't forget the works of God. And when you think that you've gone too far, you have it. You have it. If God can redeem the people in the wilderness who he showed his signs and his wonders to. If God can redeem Israel. Can he not also redeem the filthy heathen Gentiles. My brothers and my sisters. My sons and my daughters. My friends. My brethren. Don't forget the water that God gave you. And by the way, he didn't just do that once. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that that rock followed them everywhere they went. There wasn't a place, Ron and Sandy, that God didn't have water already set up for them to partake of. There wasn't a place where they went to, that God wasn't going to protect them. If you read this story, where was we back in uh, Exodus 17? If you keep reading that story, right after this, right after they got the water, they got attacked by the Amalekites. And that's the story where they, Moses held up the rod like this, and he had to have Aaron and her help him hold up his arms like this so that as long as the, the rod was held up, the Israelites prevailed in battle and they won that victory. Do you think God is so weak and has forgotten to forgive you and to love you and to have mercy on you? Have you forgotten the works of God? Have you forgotten the water that God has given you? Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it.